Every single day, thousands of elephants undergo brutality and torture at the hands of us human beings, leading to this incredible species becoming endangered. In the following documentary, I'll be sharing the heartbreaking story of the Asian elephants of Thailand and also the incredible work done by the Elephant Nature Park Sanctuary to protect this incredible species. Elephants are known as the gentle giants of the wildlife kingdom and are the largest land animal on earth, with male elephants capable of growing over 12 feet and weighing more than 7 tons. Wild elephants can live for up to 60 to 70 years and have the longest pregnancy of any mammal at almost 22 months, birthing calves capable of weighing up to 1.2 tons. There are more than 10 physical characteristics that differentiate Asian and African elephants, with the main differences being their size, the shape of their ears and heads. Asian elephants are smaller than their African counterpart and have more of an M-shaped head, domed on either side with an indentation down the middle, whilst African elephants have fuller, more rounded heads. The Asian elephant's ears are smaller compared to the large fan-shaped ears of the African species as the larger surface area of the ears helps to keep African elephants cool in the blazing African sun, whereas Asian elephants tend to live in cool jungle areas so their ears are smaller. Most people believe that there are only two species of elephant in the world, in fact there are three, the African savanna, the African forest and the Asian elephant. The Asian elephant is the largest land mammal on the Asian continent, reaching their full size at roughly 17 years of age and they currently populate to 13 countries. An elephant's trunk is incredibly large and powerful, being 6 to 7 meters in length, weighing approximately 130 kilograms for adult male and capable of lifting over 250 kilograms. The trunk is an extended nose fused with the upper lip and has no bones but is composed of blood vessels, hair, skin, bristles and up to 40,000 muscles. The trunk is highly versatile and is used for collecting food, as a snorkel for breathing underwater, interacting with other elephants and checking the scent of a newcomer. The trunk can typically hold up to 8 litres of water that elephants then transfer to their mouths and they also use it to spray dust and mud over their bodies to repel insects provide sun protection and regulate temperature. Now unlike you and me, elephants do not have sweat glands and only have pores between their toes so they can't sweat like us and instead rely on other cooling mechanisms such as gentle flapping of the ears and thin hairs on their skin which transfer heat away from their body. The elephant's skin is interestingly both thick and thin, with the skin behind the ears, beneath the tail and in the groin as thin as 1mm to keep the elephant cool. Elsewhere, an elephant's skin in most places is thick, approximately 2.5 to 3cm thick to be exact, with many folds and wrinkles which enables them to retain up to 10 times more water than flat skin does. Normally an elephant's skin is grey in colour but sometimes appears red or brown depending on the local ground cover. It's worth noting that elephants can swim, but they cannot jump or technically run. Elephants have two different gaits. The first is their normal slow walking gait, and the second is faster, with reports that elephants can reach speeds of up to 25 miles per hour using this gait. You may also be aware that elephants are highly sociable animals and communicate with each other in various ways. These include touching, visual displays, vocalizations, seismic vibrations, olfaction and semiochemicals. Elephants can make many different sounds, but the one we know best is the trumpet sound, which is made by the elephant passing wind through its sinuses. They make this sound when they feel excited, frightened or even to express anger. Elephants can also communicate over long distances to members of their herd by sending and receiving low frequency rumble sounds. These calls are mostly below the frequency of 20 Hz which is beyond the human ability to hear, but these sounds are certainly not quiet as when projected they can be heard by other elephants up to 6 miles away. 
An elephant can perceive these rumbles by both foot and trunk sensations since the sounds travel through the ground as well as the air. So as well as via its ears, the elephant picks up the vibrations by bone conduction. The receiving elephant will lift one front leg and face the sound source or touch their trunk to the ground to concentrate on detecting these infrasound vibrations. Elephants can also make a bellowing roar which appears to be the result of a disturbance and these roars can reach 112 decibels which is almost as loud as a jet taking off. It also appears that elephants make a chirp which is a sound believed only to be made by Asian elephant herds. The elephant is the largest of all the herbivores and with that huge size comes a huge appetite. They can eat up to 18 hours a day with a diet consisting of fruits, leaves of various plants, bamboo and tree bark. Although a fully grown elephant eats between 140 to 270 kilograms per day, it will only digest about 40% of this food properly. Just like humans, elephants live together in a society but the lives of males, known as bulls, and females, known as cows, are very different. The females live together in a herd or family led by the oldest female, the matriarch, but if there's too many members, the older females will break away and set up a smaller group of their own. When male elephants become more solitary with age, they're often turned away from their group for several hours, even several days, and between ages of roughly 12 to 15, they will break away permanently but still keep loose ties with other males. Must is a biological condition affecting all adult male elephants and it occurs once a year for typically two to three months. When in must, male elephants testosterone rises by about 60% and they become very aggressive so it's very dangerous to get close to a male elephant on must, even if he appears to be calm. The elephant's head contains the largest brain of any land animal, weighing approximately 5 kilograms, which is over 3 times larger than a human brain. Elephants are one of the world's most intelligent animals and have a brain complex similar to humans in terms of both structure and complexity. They have the ability to show many feelings, such as grief, happiness, the ability to focus on a common interest, how to care for an infant without a mother, and much much more. When many people see an elephant standing around and swaying backwards and forwards or swinging its trunk around back and forth, they think that the elephant's happy and is dancing. It is exactly the opposite. This is a sign of mental stress. Unfortunately, the elephants cannot speak out for themselves and say, please stop this. That is why I'm so proud to speak on their behalf. Once common throughout Africa and Asia, elephant numbers stood at approximately 12 million at the start of the 20th century. Now, the African species has fallen to a figure estimated below 400,000, whilst the Asian variety has fallen to a disturbingly low figure of under 40,000. Asian elephants are categorised into four subspecies, the Sumatran elephant, Sri Lankan elephant, Bornean elephant and Indian elephant. Thai elephants are classed as Indian elephants, despite being smaller, having shorter front legs, and a thicker body than other elephants of the Indian subspecies. At the beginning of the 20th century, over 100,000 elephants are estimated to have roamed free in Thailand. Now, less than 1,000 remain in the wild and are on the verge of extinction. Meanwhile, the captive elephant population used in the various forms of elephant tourism in Thailand currently stands at approximately 3,000. Elephants and their predecessors are believed to have been in Thailand since approximately 16 million years ago and have a rich ingrained place in Thailand's culture and identity. The Asian elephants of Thailand were once a symbol of leadership and power. Now, they reflect some of the struggles and injustices in Thailand's development. The first recorded mention of elephants in Thailand, formerly called the Kingdom of Siam, was in 1292. At this time, elephants were synonymous with royalty and the more elephants a king possessed, the more status and power he had. Thai elephants were used as weapons in battle from the 15th century as their strength and size made them a powerful force. 
By the end of the 19th century, elephants increasingly became a key form of transport in the Kingdom of Siam until the inception of motorized vehicles later in the 1900s, and they were no longer used in battle due to being ineffective with the spread of firearms and other gunpowder weaponry as warfare began to modernize. The end of the 19th century also marked the onset of elephants being widely used in the lucrative logging industry, hauling tweak wood through dense jungle, clearing forests and carrying timber. Ironically, elephants were being used to destroy their own habitat. Logging was banned in Thailand in 1989, but by then the damage had been done. In 1900, Thailand had around 90% forest cover, but by 1989, only 28% of the country's forests remained. The removal of the elephant's habitat led to clashes with human populations, particularly in agricultural areas. Combined with the issues of ivory and trophy hunting, the result was numbers dropping so severely that the Asian elephant was listed as an endangered species in 1986. In October of 1988, following flash floods and landslides caused by deforestation, there was mounting public pressure to end the logging trade. Thailand experienced its worst flooding in nearly a century. 350 people died and £115 million worth of property was lost. The damage was exasperated by additional deforestation and in a bold move, a couple of months after the floods, the Thai government banned logging completely in 1989. Suddenly, hundreds of loggers were redundant, so too were thousands of elephants. Due to the destruction of much of Thailand's forests, there was not enough habitat remaining for these elephants to survive. This led to dark times of illegal logging, begging and malnourishment alongside owners having to use their elephants in new ways, and thus, the elephant tourism industry was born. As owners of elephants, known as mahouts, looked for new ways to earn money, several of these mahouts travelled with their elephants to large cities such as Bangkok and Chiang Mai for street begging. Elephants used for street begging suffered injuries to their feet from the searing hot roads, damage to their hearing, dehydration, malnourishment, extreme psychological stress, as well as major injuries and even death. At this point, elephants were walking the city streets, and as competition increased, so were the expectations put on them. Many were now being trained to perform unnatural and demeaning tricks in circuses in order to differentiate themselves and draw in tourists. In 2010, elephant protection laws made street begging illegal. However, the practice is difficult to eradicate completely and unbelievably, street begging can still be found. After begging was made illegal, more emphasis was put on the remaining aspects of elephant tourism. Elephants continued to be mistreated in circuses and camps to perform tricks, and the availability of elephant rides increased. Elephant spines cannot support the weight of people, meaning elephant riding leads to permanent spinal injuries. Also, the clunky contraptions often worn rubs on their backs, causing blisters that can become infected. The conditions at elephant camps are often appalling, and when not performing for tourists, the elephants are often kept on short chains with no opportunity to socialize and are denied adequate food and water. Elephant tourism has proved to be hugely popular in recent years, and despite elephants suffering from a variety of mental and physical ailments in tourism settings, it is shockingly still on the rise. Many visitors to Thailand and other parts of Asia are unaware of the physical and psychological harm caused to elephants in the tourism industry. In order for elephants to be used in the tourism industry, a long and painful training process using severe punishment, abuse and torture is used. This well hidden secret of elephant tourism is called Fajan in Thailand, which translates to the crush. Elephants in the tourism industry are stolen from the wild as babies and their mothers killed alongside any other nearby adult elephants. After a baby elephant is captured, the elephant is chained into a crush cage. This is a cage designed to be too small for the elephant to stand in, and they have their legs chained together and stretched. Throughout this time, they are stabbed with sharp tools and bull hooks, beaten and screamed at, as well as deprived of sleep, starved and given only enough water to survive. After days and weeks of constant torture, the elephant's soul is broken. The baby elephant is now submissive enough 
to be trained to entertain and interact closely with tourists. At this stage, the elephant is introduced to the person who will become their handler, their mahout. It is this person who has been complicit in the process who will release the elephant from the cage, bring them their first meal and give them water. Sadly, the elephant sees this human as their saviour. Throughout the training process, the elephant is destined for further suffering and the mahouts typically still beat, abuse and neglect their elephants as a reminder of their place. All wild caught and captive bred elephants undergo this cool training in their early years if they are to be used for activities such as riding and shows but also where tourists may closely interact with the animals during other tourist interactions such as street begging and bathing. The demand from tourism drives the demand for these elephant experiences and trainers deploying these methods resulting in thousands of baby elephants being destined for a lifetime of trauma. This is the dark side of elephant tourism and brings us to today, where Asian elephants have dropped in numbers to the point of endangerment as a species and are on the verge of extinction. In Thailand, there now remains less than 1,000 elephants in the wild. Meanwhile, roughly 3,000 elephants are in captivity, where they suffer as victims of the tourism industry. As urbanisation, industrial development and agricultural expansion from humans has increased, Asian elephants' habitats have shrunk rapidly Asia does not have the land resources for both humans and the indigenous wildlife populations. Whilst it is inevitable that much land is set aside for growing human populations, there are certain individuals seeking huge land areas for personal gain, for illegal logging, encroachment into protected areas and environmentally detrimental pursuits such as trekking camps, which have further destroyed the home of the elephant and other wildlife populations. Even where suitable habitat exists, poaching remains a threat to the elephants in many areas. There are still places where the trade is thriving and unregulated domestic ivory markets in a number of countries fuel the illegal international trade. Although most of this ivory comes from poaching of African elephants, Asian elephants, specifically tusked males, are also illegally hunted for their ivory. There is also a steadier market for other elephant products, which bypass legislative loopholes such as skin, feet, ears and tails, which continues to fuel poaching. Thailand has at least 27 laws concerning the protection of elephants and is the only country in the world where elephants are classified as both wild and domestic, where their latter definition allows exploitation. This means that vulnerable, captive elephants can be traded, bred and used in tourism for elephant shows, elephant riding and commercial breeding to exploit these gentle giants. There is also the issue of many working and performing elephants in Thailand being illegally poached from Myanmar and trafficked into Thailand. Trafficked animals can be passed off as being locally reared with birth and ownership documentation falsified. For several reasons, it can be unfeasible to return elephants to the wild, and this is where sanctuaries come in. Asian elephant experts argue that there is not enough natural habitat left in Thailand for these captive elephants to be set free. The best chance of survival for the endangered Asian elephant lies in preserving the remaining wild elephant populations and protecting the captive population by providing a home for them where they are respected and well cared for without having to entertain tourists. Fortunately, many elephants have been rescued by nature lovers and one such saviour is Sangduen Chailat, better known as Lek, owner and founder of Save Elephant Foundation and Elephant Nature Park. Thank <laughs> you. 
The Sangduan Cha Alert, also known as Lek, was born in Thailand in 1961, in a very small village up in the mountains in North Thailand. Her family belonged to the Kemu clan, a mountain folk that from generation to generation had concerned itself primarily with the care of elephants. The village lay in the middle of the jungle where there were no roads and no means of communication. There was no school in the village, so from a young age, Lek had to leave her home to receive tuition in the city. When Lek was five years old, her grandfather was given an elephant named Tong Kam in return for saving the life of a young man. The bond that developed between Lek and Tong Kam sparked a love and respect for elephants that was to shape the course of her life. Many people think elephant is a big animal as may be dangerous, but I want people to know that they are big animals, but they are so gentle. And for this big body, they have such a gentle heart and kind. They get injury, they lost their trunk, they lost their you know, leg. These animals still have a gentle heart and forgive the people, and I want the people to know that elephant in in this side they're not dangerous but they are they are really uh, beautiful gentle giant after graduating from Chiang Mai Rajabat University with an arts degree Lek worked in the tourism industry where she witnessed the mistreatment and suffering of many elephants and began to provide medical aid to elephants in remote villages Lek met her husband Derek Thompson in 1985 and they married in 1987 from the start, Lek brought Derek up to date with her ideals and that they donated all that she earned to improving the welfare of elephants. Derek was 100% behind her ideals. In the 1900s, Lek started rescuing injured, neglected and elderly elephants and the first elephant to be rescued was in 1992. In 1995, both Save Elephant Foundation and the original Elephant Nature Park had been established starting with nine elephants and with Lek as the founder of both Save Elephant Foundation and Elephant Nature Park and Derek as co-founder of Save Elephant Foundation. The Elephant Nature Park's original location proved to be an interim measure until 2003 when Lek received a donation of 6 million baht from Bert and Christine von Roma to purchase 50 acres of land in the beautiful Maytang Valley near Chiang Mai in Northern Thailand. This became the new permanent home for Elephant Nature Park. Today, Elephant Nature Park has expanded to cover around 250 acres and is home to over 100 rescued elephants from the logging and tourism industry who are able to now live free from abuse within family herds and develop close friendships with one another. Elephants at the sanctuary are not required to work, do not perform tricks and are not ridden. Instead, they are allowed to live a more dignified, natural life where they are respected and live chain free. I come from the tribe, and I come from the poor family, and uh, I never thought that I would come to this point today and I always think that is I want to be the nurse, I want to be, you know, some some job that can help people. But you know, I, I for, to come from the tribe on people I always fight for the right, fight for the woman right. But after I fight the elephant that is have so much abuse and they have no voice to fight for that, I change my direct my direction that is to speak for them, to be to be voice for the voiceless, especially for elephant and other animals. So I have dreamed before, you know, it's a lot of a lot of job. It's like a like a all teenage. I I I, I dream to be it's a lot of things, you know I, I want to be doctor, I want to be teacher, I want to be nurse, but in the end of the day that when I see elephant get abused, I just said, this is it, I will I will help them. 
several of the elephants rescued display broken backs from wearing riding chairs at 24 hours a day, malnourished physiques and wounded feet from wearing metal restraints around the ankle. Other elephants rock and sway from psychological scars and prefer to remain alone, which is contrary to elephant behaviour, remaining untrusting and fearful. A number of the elephants that have been rescued are also blind, some in this condition because of the damage done by circus spotlights and one forcefully blinded by a former mahout with a slingshot. All of our elephants here have common backgrounds. They, if the older they are, of course, they, they worked in the younger. The older ones all worked in logging, the younger ones not so. They started out their lives in trekking and, and, uh, and show and uh, street begging. Uh, street begging and has been banned, of course. Uh, one day maybe uh, trekking will be too because we recognize it as an abusive and harmful habit and, uh, and that's, that's knowledge. That's knowledge on the part of the consumer, the part of the tourist to travel responsibly and, and, uh, and think um, and, be, and have respect when he travels, uh, not just for other people but for, for those that uh, are sought to be entertainment. They, don't, they, have, they exist for more than our own entertainment value and um, they are the most remarkable. If we can stand back and watch them, observe them, then certainly a, uh, I see a future and hope for a future for the captive elephant to be found in, in sanctuary, uh, thoroughgoing, all elephants, and no elephants being used for entertainment purposes, whatever that may be. At the Elephant Nature Park, these elephants have been given a new lease of life and rejuvenated. At the sanctuary, the elephants are provided space to roam freely and play, food to eat and regular medical care by the full-time veterinarians. Most importantly, the elephants are allowed to form close-knit social groups where, as Lek describes it, they teach each other how to be elephants again after years of social isolation practices used by the industry to control their behaviour. I promise, you know, when I have the elephant, when I rescue the elephant, when they come from the hard life, they hardly walk, they're very sad, and then after that, I see their chain. I see they run, I see they have the hurt, I see they have a family. That is the most i proud of, and not just the elephant, all kind of animals when they are transformer. That is, it make me happy, and that's a big reward for us from our hard work. In addition to elephants, EMP and Save Elephant Foundation has rescued hundreds of animals throughout the country from the slaughterhouse and has provided a safe haven to dogs, cats, cows, buffalo, boars and many more animals. We have many different species come from everywhere, especially during COVID. We have like a hundred percent people dump animals to us. Even today we still have people dump uh, the dog to us. So we have dog, cat, Cow, buffalo, we rescue from slaughterhouse. Horse come from the horse racing. People don't want. Uh, we have uh, rabbit that come from laboratory. We have uh, monkey also come from uh, animal test lab. We have so many, many, many kind of animals and uh, who stay with us. Like a cow, buffalo. If we don't help them, they will go back to slaughterhouse. I have no choice that I have to help. I in every spot here. If we have I rather share for them, you know, and it doesn't, I know that it's everything quite clouded, but if they stay here with a happy, I will be, you know, I will, I rather to give a spare to them. EMP dogs began as a result of catastrophic floods in Bangkok towards the end of 2011. Over 2,000 dogs were pulled to safety, and EMP rescued over 200 dogs from the floods using rented boats navigating the Bangkok streets which had turned to rivers. After the floods, large dog runs were built at EMP for the rescued dogs, alongside a small animal hospital being constructed and a full-time vet and clinic manager being employed to care for EMP's new family as well as provide community outreach services to residents in the area surrounding the park. EMP now has over 90 different runs, almost 100 different packs, and 640 dogs. Several of these dogs have been puppies or pregnant mothers from surrounding communities that have suffered malnutrition, disease, abuse, and neglect. EMP's efforts have also saved several dogs from the illegal dog meat trade in Laos and Vietnam, as well as from puppy mills where the dogs are continuously locked up for the purposes of breeding over and over in an endless cycle never having the chance to live outside of a cage. 
Most of them are traumatized and have physical problems due to the extreme confinement and exhaustion, which leads to a variety of medical issues. I think some of my best stories are stories about the handicapped dogs, especially we, we spend a lot of time every day with the handicapped dogs, walking them, especially working with extra volunteers and guests here, telling them the kind of success stories we have with some of the dogs, you know, where they come in in an extremely poor condition, you know, legs broken, sometimes bits of their body hanging off, spines broken, been dragged along the floor, wounds, you know, you've never seen anything quite like it. And after usually, it's quite incredible, a couple of weeks of the correct care, the correct medicine, food, love, they bounce back and, you know, putting them in their chair for the first time, seeing them run around like crazy. They have a new group of friends. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty incredible thing to tell people, really. And especially some of the dogs as well that walk again. So we have hydrotherapy, we do physiotherapy here. Some dogs we even send away for acupuncture if they show us the right kind of the qualities that something might come back. Mm. Um, yeah, we've got some dogs here that have been handicapped. They've not been able to walk. They've been using a wheelchair and then after doing all, uh, you know, hydrotherapy and physio, they've been able to walk again, which is amazing. There are more than 200 million stray dogs worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. And typically, there are three sources of stray dogs. Lost dogs, dogs born stray, and abandoned dogs. A lost dog once had a home and has since become lost. Responsible dog owners should ensure their dogs live in a controlled environment and cannot wander off, as well as making sure their dogs have collars with dog tags that display the name and phone number of the owner. Also, microchipping and registering a dog in a local or national database will ensure that even if the dog's collar is removed, the dog will always carry the owner's information so any vet or animal rescue centre can use a chip scanner to identify the dog's owner and reunite dog and owner. Many dogs are simply born stray. In most cases, they are first or second generation stray after their parents or grandparents were previously abandoned. Unfortunately, the most common cause of stray dogs is the intentional illegal abandonment of a dog by its owner. The typical situation is families rush to get a puppy without being fully aware of the responsibilities of becoming a dog owner, resulting in the pet being dropped off in a remote location so that it can't find its way back home. I think often when we get dogs that have been dumped at the gate, it's quite sad. So, similar, like I said, with, if, you've, if you know it's been a pet at some point and it's just been literally thrown out of a car or tied to the post or something like that, and you can kind of almost see in their eyes that they've been loved by someone, and then all of a sudden that's just gone. We get lots of rescues in in volume, so lots of dogs. Um, for me, I mean, the challenging part is to ensure that you can uh, give them the right care that they deserve, I think is a, is a big thing for me, especially when we have lots of dogs. So, and ensuring that in the future that their life continues to be good, that they get placed in the right place in the park, they, they have friends, you know, they get the right attention, and then hopefully at some point they can get adopted and we, we can kind of, I guess what, put them on a good journey, you know, which is a good thing, especially when you see them come in and it's horrendous and then you can see their journey from, you know, abused dog to a dog that's been loved and cared for. There's only one solution, responsible pet ownership. Owners have a duty to provide sufficient and appropriate care for their pets, microchip and ideally neuter or prevent from uncontrollable breeding. Following the outlawing of the dog meat trade in Thailand in 2014, there's been an increased focus on spraying and neutering as many dogs as possible, as neutering is being widely recognised as the most humane, effective and sustainable method of controlling the stray population. The multifaceted approach undertaken by Save Elephant Foundation and ENP includes the rescue and rehabilitation of elephants along with all animals in need, education through sustainable ecotourism, and protection of the natural environment. ENP offers free vet services to anyone who brings their animals for sterilization and vaccination, as well as a free mobile clinic that offers medical care in remote areas where there are no animal hospitals. To date, EMP has provided vaccines and treatments to over 3,000 animals. The positive contribution of EMP and Save Elephant Foundation extends beyond just animals also supporting local communities through a number of initiatives. ENP hire local unemployed villagers, buy elephant food from local villages, 
provide study supplies to local schools alongside teaching English, building fire breaks, providing forest restoration, as well as scholarships, accommodation and financial support to underprivileged students from local villages, as well as assisting in the construction and renovation of temples and roadworks. Additionally, ENP strives to empower women by providing local women with jobs at the park and teaching women how to earn a living using their knowledge and skills. Being an elephant caretaker, known as a mahout, is quite different at Elephant Nature Park than being a mahout elsewhere. At a typical elephant camp, a mahout tries to maintain total control of the elephant at all times and their relationship is based on pain and fear. The elephant has little or no free roaming time and is expected to obey the mahout's commands or face the painful consequences. In contrast, at Elephant Nature Park, looking after an elephant is a mostly hands-off affair. There is no riding the elephants and no bull hooks. ENP encourage their mahouts to let the elephants do what they want and not intervene unless it is necessary. Save Elephant Foundation and Elephant Nature Park educates their mahouts by teaching them positive reinforcement where through reward, love and care, the mahout elephant relationship is created in all of its purity. In March 2020, Thailand closed its borders to international visitors in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, an action that suddenly cut off the income stream used to care for thousands of Thailand's captive elephants in the tourism industry across more than 250 elephant camps. Many elephants face starvation and long unbroken periods on chains without appropriate care. Save Elephant Foundation, led by its founder Lek Chalhut, immediately stepped in to provide support for as many elephants as possible throughout the crisis. Save Elephant Foundation initiated immediate support for a number of projects dedicated to providing help, including an elephant food bank, the Farm to Herd campaign, elephant foster programs and upskilling people working with elephants to supplement their income during the crisis and beyond. ENP has extended this support beyond the pandemic to continue to provide local community outreach services, rescue and rehabilitation programs and educational ecotourism operations. The number of former trekking camps that Save Elephant Foundation and ENP has converted to ethical elephant friendly venues by providing their support has continually grown over the years. Save Elephant Foundation currently supports over 30 ethical elephant projects throughout Thailand as well as in Cambodia and Laos. As the founder of Save Elephant Foundation and Elephant Nature Park, Lek has been working for over two decades to improve the lives of elephants in Asia and advance their welfare, striving to achieve her ultimate goal for all elephants to live a free life in the wild, for the elephants to no longer have to work, to no longer be the object of humans, to be free and only helped by humans when necessary. To work with the, the elephant and to fight against the cruelty and and to fight against the benefit of the group of the people who make business for elephant. This is the most hard time because it's, as a woman and I have no background you know, for, from the family, uh, it's not easy at all and I get a lot of attack you know, from the people who lost benefit. And this is all the time challenge with so many things. And yes, it's not easy job and I get cyber bullying, I get uh, physical, uh, like a threatening and like a, also it's a lot of things, you know, like a uh, they turn threatening for my life and it's, it's, this is a lot, a lot of things, you know, and, and my family also get effect from this as well, so uh, it's, it's hard, but, but I, I won't give up, you know, I still carry on to work. Lek continues to be at the forefront of elephant rights issues and works tirelessly to raise international awareness about the plight of both captive and wild Asian elephants. She has initiated projects dedicated to improving the well-being of elephants throughout Asia, including in Thailand, Cambodia, Myanmar, India and Laos. Over the years, Lek has been extremely influential in improving the lives of hundreds of elephants in Asia through Save Elephant Foundation by educating elephant owners and helping them to transition away from elephant riding, performances and other harmful practices and instead adopt the saddle off model based on compassion, understanding and respect. 
Leg deserves all the support she can get from everyone who has a soft spot for elephants and who supports her dream, for all elephants to lead a free life in their natural environment. I will be donating 5% of any profits from this documentary to Save Elephant Foundation and EMP, where these donations are used to buy medicines, secure more land for herds, and to buy the elephants in acute danger and in great need of being removed immediately from their owners. Over a ton of food also needs to be brought for the elephants every day, and all of this costs money, of which there is a constant shortage. The story of the Asian elephant is one of struggle and survival in the face of adversity. Through Save Elephant Foundation and ENP, LEC has been at the forefront of protecting elephants in Asia for over two decades, but there is still much work to be done. There's a growing awareness among tourists that circus style shows using elephants and elephant riding is clearly unethical and causes immense suffering. But instead of driving tourists away from elephant entertainment altogether, it's led to a rise in the popularity of washing venues, with the number of such venues in Thailand more than tripling in the last five years. Tourists are unknowingly driving elephant cruelty by choosing softer interactions such as bathing and petting, but these cause just as much suffering as elephant rides and shows. Whilst bathing and petting elephants itself might not be directly harmful, it's the process to get the elephants to go against their natural instincts to avoid humans that's often unethical. Now Thailand, they use the word sanctuary, they use the word, they use uh, conservation, they use a retirement program, but the facts is not, they use for marketing. The sanctuary is not a real sanctuary. The sanctuary is sometimes uh, behind the scene, they still chain and shackle. There was sanctuary only in front of the camera. When the camera come, and every, every elephant are free. But still, they use, use hook. They still force elephant to go to the river for bath. To go, people climbing up on their neck and start to uh, use elephant for entertainment. Sanctuary that you have to let elephant be elephant and let them be join the herd. The herd is the most important for them. It's not about us. It's about them. It's about the elephant, what they need. They already have some of them, like a Ban Yen, she, she served with people for more than seven decades. She don't need to come to on the river to let people to ride or bar to them. They have a very long trunk and can hold a lot of water that they can do. Let them enjoy with their own. We don't have to go there and ride their neck and control them. So I think sometimes sanctuary that is for the market and for the brand, for people to, to buy it. To buy to come and visit. Most tourists don't realise in order for an elephant to be docile enough to stand there and let you touch it safely, that elephant is exploited and often still abused in the same way as elephants trained to be used in circus style shows and for riding. Whether taken from the wild or bred in captivity, all elephants used for close contact tourist interactions such as bathing and petting have undergone the traumatic fear-based training method known as the crush. Elephants at such tourist attractions are also typically kept chained day and night, fed poor diets and receive limited veterinary care. Mahouts at unethical venues will also prod the elephants with a bull hook or other discreet tools to inflict further pain and punishment as a reminder of their place. When tourists support these venues, they support this cruelty behind the scenes and help the industry thrive. The elephant entertainment industry is part of the multi-billion pound global wildlife trade. Wildlife tourism accounts for 10 to 20% of the global tourism industry and the key issue of wildlife tourism is that most people are unaware of what happens behind the scenes. Seeing an elephant is on most people's to-do list when visiting Thailand and there are hundreds of elephant experiences all over the country. However, the industry is plagued with deception surrounding the truth behind where these animals are born how they are trained and the economics behind this industry. The system is designed to be confusing. Most tourists seemingly want to do the right thing. They love animals and want to get close to them, which is simple and understandable. Many people enjoy for elephant riding and circus because they didn't know. I, and I didn't blame, I don't blame them. If they know, they will do better. So I think the only thing that to make the change is education. Show them the facts, let them know the truth, and then they will they will change. And I, I know that people is, I think more than 50% people is not too bad. They, they do because they didn't know. Everyone make mistake. Myself, I make mistake too. But now when we know, we can turn 360 degrees 
and we can turn like 100, 180 degrees, not 360. We can turn that and can work for it. Elephant camps are a lucrative business with one of the highest margins in travel, and captive elephants are a cornerstone of Thailand's tourism industry. Unethical captive elephant venues in Thailand cater to thousands of visitors daily, and the industry generates over £500 million per year from exploiting endangered Asian elephants. Currently, the Thai government encourages elephant training for the tourism industry, subsidising it with monthly stipends paid to mahouts once they can demonstrate an elephant in their care has mastered free tricks and is actively performing in local shows or giving rights to tourists. The Surin Project was established in 2009 by the Save Elephant Foundation and offers an alternative, ethical source of tourist income to the traditional elephant entertainment. However, as long as tourists are willing to pay high prices for unethical elephant encounters, the capture, breeding, training and torture of elephants will continue. Tourists hold considerable power to turn their backs on unethical practices and can opt instead to see elephants in their natural habitat or support elephant-friendly venues. So, does that mean that sanctuaries are unethical for tourists to visit? Well, the answer depends on the sanctuary itself and the experience offered. The best place to see an elephant is in the wild or at a genuine elephant sanctuary that encourages observation rather than direct contact with elephants. Venues that offer tourists a chance to watch elephants in genuine sanctuaries are beacons of hope that can encourage the urgently needed shift in the captive elephant tourism industry. As word spreads about the horrific truth behind the elephant tourism industry, tour operators and national parks around the world are taking a stance. Some venues have changed for the better as awareness has grown surrounding issues such as elephant rides and more recently other forms of close contact such as through bathing and petting. So far, 250 travel brands worldwide have committed to not sell or promote elephant entertainment, rides or shows. This now includes major online travel players including Booking.com, TripAdvisor and Airbnb. However, there's still a lot more to be done. To encourage more businesses to follow suit, tourists should choose to visit elephants in the wild or at genuine sanctuaries that operate on a hands-off observational approach with limited or no physical interaction with the elephants. You have tremendous power as the consumer to change things and you're at the heart of this story just as much as anyone else is. The biggest danger elephant and threaten their life human. Because human is in everywhere for both wild and captivity. Uh, but the more human need, the more that have bring the elephant in the great danger. So we 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 never human never feel enough. Human want all the time. Human want to use the thing they have the right to use this beautiful giant for a benefit and they don't care and they don't even think about animal welfare uh, some of them you know and that's why I think this is this is the most training and bring danger to elephant. I'd like to share with you the story of Bunma and her baby Chaba to show you the differences that your actions can make. On August 8th 2021 let Child Hurt and the team at EMP were contacted by an elephant camp owner to help rescue a mother and baby from an elephant camp. Due to the lack of income during the COVID pandemic, the owner wanted to sell some of his elephants and had chosen to let this mother and baby go because of concerns about the baby's health. The mother's name is Bunma and she is 16 years old. She is too young to be a mother without a helper or nanny, having been separated and kept alone away from her herd. The baby elephant named Chaba was not in very good condition, with a lower body weight than normal and her behaviour being lethargic and abnormal. The mother Bunma was forced to work in an elephant show, performing and painting at the camp. Since giving birth to Chaba in May 2021, Bunma had been chained in a small kennel with her baby, and clearly they were both living under immense stress. After hearing of this news, EMP immediately built an enclosure at their sanctuary, which was finished within two days to bring baby Chaba and mother Bunma to Elephant H Park. The original plan was to bring them to the park by truck, but the mother Bunma refused to go on the truck, so to alleviate her stress, instead they decided to walk. On August 12, 2021, Bunma and Chaba enjoyed their first day of their new life at EMP. At EMP, they were instantly welcomed by the other elephants at the park, 
whilst they are receiving medical treatment in their new enclosure. They are home now and free from their former chains. With love, supplements, delicious veggies and fruits, Uma was able to produce milk for nursing her baby Chaba, whose health was also improving, and she now has more confidence after their arrival. Both of them are now much more relaxed, and learning the beautiful life they didn't know they could ever have, free at their forever home. A lot of things change overnight for them. When they, they come here, they, there's no hook and there's no abuse, there's no chains. They come and they have free shelter, free access to water, sand to sleep on that's changed frequently. Uh, they have play habitats with mud and sand, they have a flowing river, and they have the potential to be with a friend, potential to be with their own kind in a significant way on a long-term basis. And that's where the real healing comes for them. The healing, we can provide medical care, we can provide assistance as is possible, uh, and uh, just to make sure they always feel safe. Uh, and uh, when they have their friends, that's the most beautiful thing, and you see the, the changes that happen inside them, and they settle down, they stop their uh, mad behavior, their stereotypic behaviors, and, uh, and calm down and, and get to know someone uh, deeply, whereas that's been denied them their whole life. Well, most elephants, this the most social animal on the planet without, and I'm not excluding humans from that bracket, uh, and they've been denied the, uh, the life of being part of a herd and live solitary in the company of others. They're not allowed to develop bonds of friendship with others, and oftentimes if they had some kind of friendship, they're sold away. And so they, they, they're broken hearted. And so they, they come with a lot of emotional trauma, psychological trauma. They come with physical trauma. And as I said, we can take care of their physical trauma as, the, as best we can. And then the rest of it is healing that is in situ, in a new place, in a place that respects them and cares about them. And, and by company with a companion who uh, understands, has been through the same thing. The exploitation of captive elephants in the tourism industry is just one part of the cruel global wildlife trade which is inflicting suffering on millions of animals and damaging our fragile ecosystems. Humans have been rampantly destroying Earth's biosphere for decades in our attempts to make a profit off of it. 99.9% .9 of critically endangered species and 67% of endangered species will die out within the next 100 years. That's thanks to us carrying out deforestation polluting the atmosphere, increasing global warming, overfishing waters, and much, much more. If we continue at our current rate of destruction, after the next 50 or 100 years, it will take nature 3 to 5 million years just to get back on track as of 2023, and between 5 to 7 million years to restore the animal kingdom to a variety existing before humans ever appeared. The world's 8 billion people represent just 0.01% of all living things. Yet, since the dawn of civilization, humanity has caused the loss of 83% of all wild mammals and over half of all plants. With a world population growing at a rate of 200,000 people a day and the destruction of wild habitats for farming, logging and development for personal gain, the result is what many scientists consider to be the sixth mass extinction of life to occur in the Earth's four billion year history. We're in a state of, uh, of emergency around the planet. This Earth is in dire need of attention and awareness and people who are uh, willing to not just be aware, but actually take action. Uh, because without action, uh, there's nothing. Uh, nothing changes, you know. So what if you're aware? Or did you do anything? And if you don't do anything, then it's too late because you just pass the problem on to another generation. And if things continue on the, the current path that we're on, uh, many will, will support the thought that we don't have long and there's not a lot of generation left. And producing children into this world is, uh, is unkind and unjust uh, when we haven't dealt with the problems that are extant, uh, that are extremely serious uh, and will um, will cause great hardships in the future as we continue to procreate. Because it's, it's that distance that we put between ourselves and, and the natural world that, that is, is absolutely destroying us. Without biodiversity, 
everything collapses. So we, we're not awake. We're not awake and we need to wake up. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to encounter an elephant on your next travels. The important thing is to do it via a wildlife experience or reputable sanctuary that meets basic animal welfare standards and allows you to observe these magnificent creatures in a natural, elephant-friendly environment. The most ethical of all experiences is to watch wild elephants in their natural habitat as these elephants have never experienced the crush. Sanctuaries which rescue abused elephants from tourism or illegal logging and follow an observational approach are the next best option. Genuine sanctuaries will allow elephants to live out their days in as close to a wild environment as they can. Elephant Nature Park in Thailand and its partner programs across Thailand, Cambodia and Laos excel at this. The welfare of captive elephants should not use resources that otherwise would be allocated for the conservation of wild populations. We need to provide appropriate care for those already in captivity and make sure we do not remove any additional elephants from the wild for elephant-based tourism. In the future, this may potentially provide the opportunity for rewilding programs in forests that have now lost their elephants. You have the power to make a significant difference by avoiding unethical practices and instead choosing ethical experiences. The more we choose ethical experiences and shift to ecotourism, the more it encourages non-ethical camps to change to meet the new demand. It can be hard to know where is truly ethical when the term elephant sanctuary, orphanage or rescue centre is frequently used as a front by tourist attractions that continues to capture and abuse elephants. However, there are many genuine sanctuaries as well as non-profit organisations that are working hard to ensure that people can observe elephants in the most responsible and ethical way possible. The first way to identify if an elephant experience is truly ethical is that an elephant sanctuary will never offer elephant riding. Elephants may look big and strong, but their backs are actually quite weak and not made to carry weight. That's why you'll never see elephants that live in their natural habitat lift anything onto their backs. Instead, you'll see them carrying heavy objects with their trunks. Elephant spines are simply not designed to support the weights of humans, and doing so can lead to permanent spinal injuries. Also, the chair itself rubs against the elephant's back, causing blisters that can get infected. Not only will an ethical elephant sanctuary never offer elephant riding for tourists, but neither will their mahouts ride them. So please, avoid supporting any organisations that offers elephant riding, even if you won't ride the elephants whilst you're there. Another sign to identify if an elephant experience is truly ethical is that elephant sanctuaries will not offer elephant entertainment. If an experience advertises shows with elephants dancing, painting or performing tricks, that's another very strong sign that it's not a responsible sanctuary. Elephants that are taught to perform are maltreated, which is why you should never support animal circuses and shows. These operators often apply the same spirit crushing technique used to train elephants of riding to force the elephants to perform tricks. Not only are these innocent elephants kept in small cages and chained up, they are also usually physically abused as well and forced into submission by the fear of being tortured. You can help change this by telling tour operators this is not right and choosing an experience which allows the elephant to exhibit its natural behaviour in a safe and non-threatening environment. Elephants should always be treated with kindness and respect and hooks should never be used. Instead, in elephant friendly venues, you'll often see mahouts accompanying elephants at a distance to keep everyone safe. Also, avoid giving money to people using elephants for begging or any other activities that create incentives for further elephant live trade. A further sign of an elephant friendly experience is that an ethical elephant sanctuary will limit direct contact with elephants. A truly elephant friendly venue will allow elephants to move around freely and socialise with other elephants without direct human elephant contact whilst educating visitors on elephant welfare. In nature, elephants would not normally come in direct contact with humans. Therefore, if a venue allows you to get close enough to ride, bath or touch an elephant, it's because they've undergone the crush and been cruelly trained. That's why truly ethical sanctuaries usually have an observe rather than disturb approach. As a tourist, you'll never know what happens behind the scenes. Therefore, the best approach is to visit sanctuaries that encourage observation 
rather than direct contact with elephants. Another telling sign is that guest numbers are kept low at responsible elephant sanctuaries. Alongside limited direct contact, an ethical elephant sanctuary will keep the visitor numbers low. When visiting a sanctuary, it's advised to ask how many visiting sessions the sanctuary hosts per day and as a rough guide, roughly 10-15 to 15 people per visit is a reasonable figure. It is also very common that an ethical elephant sanctuary will likely have a volunteer programme. If the sanctuary you're planning to visit has a volunteer programme, that's a good sign as malpractices are much harder to hide when you have animal loving volunteers around. For example, at Elephant Nature Park, for week long volunteers, each day at the park is different but the general schedule includes a rotating set of responsibilities shared by the volunteers and the staff, such as buying, cutting and picking food for the elephants as well as cleaning up after the elephants. A further sign of an ethical elephant experience is that large inadequate enclosures with no chains are provided at ethical sanctuaries. Obviously the most ideal case would be for elephants to roam in the wild, completely free from human intervention. Unfortunately, this is not always possible. Providing a large and adequate enclosure for the elephants is a very important requirement, but it can be hard to tell until you physically arrive at the sanctuary. It can be also difficult to tell from photos alone, however it's always good to check and see if there are any available photos on the organisation's website or from visitor reviews. An elephant friendly enclosure should be large enough for the elephants to roam around and should also have sufficient water, food, shade, dust or mud and be completely chain free. A further way to tell if an elephant experience is truly genuine is that ethical sanctuaries won't support captive breeding. Baby elephants are tourist magnets but truly elephant friendly venues shouldn't allow breeding. You should only be seeing young elephants in sanctuaries and orphanages where babies are rescued from the wild or from unethical camps. If captive breeding is allowed, this means the owners can breed and sell elephants on the black market, which is not good for the elephant, it's only good for the pocket of the owner. Also, captive breeding uses resources that instead should be used to protect and save those already suffering, as well as preserving the wild population, rather than introducing more elephants into a captive environment. Finally, make sure you do thorough research before you visit an elephant sanctuary. Try your best to always do thorough research on the elephant sanctuary you're planning to visit. Just because an experience might be named a sanctuary, doesn't mean it necessarily is an entirely ethical experience. Be sure to check the organisation's website, read up on their story, practices and if available their ethical animal welfare policy as well as reviews. Find out where their elephants come from, are they rescued and rehabilitated elephants from captivity or the illegal animal trade? Is it a retirement home for old retired or injured elephants? Or are they orphans that will eventually be released back into the wild? In addition to visiting a genuine sanctuary or seeing elephants in the wild on your next ventures, you can also spread the word to others. Once people understand the abuse that has to happen in order for them to ride, bath and partake in such activities that enable unnatural close interaction with an elephant, minds can then quickly change. Several venues are now becoming hands off and beginning to take an observational approach as a result of pressure from tourists, the media and others within the industry. Photos and videos are especially powerful tools to share on review sites and social media. If you book through a tour operator or agent, raise any concerns with them and word of mouth is a powerful tool on the road, particularly in hostels. Be sure to spread the word about the good places you visit too. They need all the support they can get. For me, I, I value more for the voice and of the young generation who, who I have the hope that they will change uh, the environment, they will change uh, everything that is in my age. I fight so hard, I fight for over half of my life, but I don't see things change much from whatever I expect. So I think volunteer program and the volunteer people will be a great opportunity that everyone learn and then bring the voice to come out and educate. I believe that education will make a big impact to, to make the change of animal living and also for elephants. For every company, we get on board. For every traveller, 
we educate. For every unethical elephant experience that goes unpaid for, the odds for these animals improve. Like lion petting and other animal practices, elephant tourism is driven by demand. If the demand for unethical experiences dries up, so too does the financial incentive. It's all in our power to make a difference and it starts with a choice. Finally, what message would you, would you wish for people watching this video to know about not only elephants, but also the conservation of our wildlife and the protection of our wildlife? What's the key take home message you wish people were more aware of? People think that, they're, that they have no power, that they're powerless um, and sometimes maybe uh, insignificant. And in many regards we are insignificant in the big scheme of things. As far as the world goes and time and history, uh, and we're just a blip. But the irony is that the choices we make are so dramatic, you know, they affect our present and they affect the future. The most powerful action you can take right now is to share this documentary with your friends and your family. You can also join my community by following my social media accounts as well as heading over to Jamie Clark Productions' website for more information. My ultimate vision is to form a better future for all, and together we have the power to change our world. Finally, I'd like to ask you to please open your hearts and minds to help protect and preserve the magnificent Asian elephants. On behalf of the elephants, Kapung Club, Sawadi Club, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>